Electrification is inevitable. It's a better technology. It's going to be better for the grid long term. Can the utility grid handle the electrification of the automotive industry in the United States? Porsche required branded Porsche chargers, but the reality was Porsche doesn't make those chargers. We're definitely past the honeymoon phase into a more challenging piece of the electrification that the world has in front of it. It's an inconvenient truth in a fast growing industry. A big thank you to our sponsors for making today's episode possible. Cars Commerce, Car Dealership Guy Industry Job Board, and EV Ready Energy. And now, let's get into the show. Chris Nyan on the CDG Podcast. Chris, welcome. Yoshi, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. A lot of talk about the EV industry nowadays, as we all know. Um, You know, we put out an article. I'm going to pull it up right now. We put out an article the other day. And the headline of the article was, EV Charging Network Expands Despite Public Doubts. So I'm really, really looking forward to seeing your opinion on this and uh, really the future of our country and where we're headed. It feels like the last couple of years have been a roller coaster. We've had our, the highs have been high, the lows have been low, right? I know dealers that were making a lot of money when the valuations were creeping up and that lost, you know, their pants when these, you know, the the bottom came out from under them. So it's definitely been uh, quite the roller coaster. I'm not a relationship expert, but we're definitely past the honeymoon phase into a more challenging piece of uh, uh, the electrification journey that the that 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 the world has in front of it, and uh, and I think we're experiencing a lot of those pains right now. But that's what happens when you try and accelerate uh, a new technology. So you've been you've been in some form or fashion with the within the or adjacent to the EV industry for quite some time. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and your experience in this industry? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I uh, did not do anything related to energy in college, but thought it was something that was really interesting to hop into. So chose to do it over what I got my degree in and started on the ground floor at a solar company. So um, if you got an obnoxious phone call uh, back in the day looking to put rooftop solar in your house, that could have been me. Uh, eventually ended up moving up in the ranks at the solar company. They were acquired by Tesla and Tesla needed to create an energy strategy. So um, worked in the showrooms uh, across the United States at Tesla, helping them build their Tesla energy showroom strategy for battery storage, uh, rooftop solar, and uh, eventually got a phone call from ChargePoint, which is the largest charging company in North America today. Uh, the initial focus at the time, we were looking to build one of these fast charging networks. Uh, what it ended up materializing into is a focus on uh, working with the utilities and policymakers across the United States, helping them build the rules towards electrification and funding that's available, and eventually uh, moved into leading automotive dealership strategy uh, at ChargePoint, helping dealerships make investments that, uh, and I think this is going to be a large part of our discussion today, but help dealerships make investments that uh, stand the test of time. Uh, After a while, realized a big gap in the industry, which we're going to get to, um, and realized that it was possible to start a company around this inconvenient truth in the industry. Uh, And so it's a big focus of ours now, but the name of our of our company is EV Ready Energy. And uh, we work a lot with automotive manufacturers, dealer groups, dealerships, as well as other verticals as well. You said you said something, what do you mean by this inconvenient truth? Like, what what does that mean to you? I think what's happening in the industry right now, and it was something that that uh, I identified uh, several years ago, is that because the world is trying to transition to a you know a cleaner future or let's call it an electrified future, uh, there are components of installing charging stations that uh, end up costing the end user a lot more money, and they never realized it. Uh, and it's tied to how utilities work, and and how customers are charged for electricity. And in general, it is an ignored um, an ignored fact in the industry for most customers. Where they kind of kind of find out this inconvenient truth after the fact, after they were they made the investment, they were forced to make the investment, and in many cases, um, customers who install charging stations are being charged significantly more than than they need to be or should be. What are you seeing in the industry right now? It's like the the you know what's the variance there, right? If I'm a dealer right now and I'm like, okay, I want to invest in this EV transition, I think that there's lots of money to be made. And that I'm going to be selling more of these, right? What is what are dealers actually facing there when it comes to the variance in costs? There, there's two ways that dealers are installing charging stations today. One is because they want to. That's uh, that happens. That's the exception. 
But in, in almost all cases, it's because they're being forced to. It's because the auto manufacturer is telling them, hey, you have to install this many charging stations by this point in time, or you're not going to get allocation of new inventory. Or you're not checking off all of your compliance for yet whatever the auto manufacturer is requiring. And so um, the challenge, though, is, 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 is where the focus is. The focus is generally on the installation. And it should be. Obviously, that should be a focus is the installation. The other focus is on the charging solution and what charging solution they recommend or that they require. And th these are all things that require expertise. But in general, what, what is ignored is how utilities work. That is ignored. The, the focus with utilities is how to get capacity to a site so that stations can be installed uh, and activated, but how you're actually charged for that electricity is ignored. And it's not a, a great story for dealerships. I would, I would estimate that dealerships in Massachusetts combined are probably losing over $100 million a year in costs that they could be saving if they were to change and alter and think through how they were installing charging stations with the utility. Now, when you say 100 million is a big number, what are you referring to? Are you referring to like, their costs that it's associated with them actually supplying these charging stations? Yeah, so it, it doesn't have to do with the supply of the chargers. It doesn't have to do with the installation. It strictly has to do with the way that utilities charge for electricity. And so just to give you some context there, um, utilities are, you know, they're essentially construction companies, right? And so they're responsible for recovering the costs of, of, of a utility grid. Utility grids in New York City look very different than, you know, rural Kansas. And so the cost structure is very different across the United States. Related to EV charging, what's unique about EV charging is the load profile for charging stations. Most dealerships use, let's call it 100 kilowatts, 125, 150 kilowatts. Uh, some brands are requiring right now that dealerships install 700 kilowatts of power. So in some cases, just the chargers are using seven times the amount of power of a dealership. And um, there's this process with the utility called rate design, where utilities um, build rate tariffs, uh, uh, rate, they, they have rate tariffs, and they build them for different load profiles of customers. But because EV charging has such a unique load profile, generally what happens is a customer gets thrown into a rate that costs them significantly more money for charging than it needs to. And that can be avoided in many cases. Um, and that's one thing that, that we primarily focus on is helping customers understand how to uh, navigate their rate tariffs. How did you uncover this stuff? Like this is very like, deep, like almost like esoteric stuff. Do you have a background in like engineering or like, you know, where did you kind of have this like, aha, like this is like a massive waste in our industry. Where did that come from? Yeah, it was a very specific moment in time. When I joined ChargePoint, what we were doing is we were helping companies, uh, we were helping states release Appendix D funding so that they could, so that whether it was a dealership or he, you know, whoever it was, could get their capital costs covered. If you're familiar with the NEVI funding, I'm sure you've heard about that related to EV charging, um, where you can get 80% of cost covered. We would help states essentially c come out come out with the funding. Uh, and, then, and then on the utility side, we would help utilities come out with funding as well. But what we realized very quickly was what was cost prohibitive wasn't because we, we would build payback models for DC fast charging. And what we would realize is that what was cost prohibitive wasn't, well, it's the co it's the capital cost too. That's, that's a pain point for everybody, of course. But the thing that nobody's talking about is literally how the utility charges you for electricity. And so um, as we would build models across the United States for customers who are installing these charging stations, we would see the risk in different utility, ter utility territories across the US which would then you know, cause us to go to these utilities and try and figure out alternative solutions so that end users were not at risk. And, and that's kind of where, you know, where, where EV Ready stemmed from. Don't get me wrong, we're charging experts. We can talk about the charging solutions. We can talk about the installation. Um, there are a few other uh, dealer challenges related to EV in the industry that we can talk about on this podcast. But the, the, the biggest um, challenge is uh, how 
the charging stations are connected to the building, connected to the utility, uh, utility and how they're being charged for it. How is this not like a bigger topic in like the public discourse? Like it's again, you threw some really big numbers out there and you're met, you're, you're making some great points, but how, like, how is this not, you know, like all the news is about the, you know, the hardware, right? And like, Hey, like these chargers, that chargers, this seems like a pretty big deal. Like, so why do you think that hasn't kind of made it to the mainstream media headlines and stuff like that? Yeah, it, it's an inconvenient truth in a fast growing industry. So um, I would say rate tariffs are some version of a college degree. Uh, they're not easy to read. And um, a lot of utilities, you know, utilities are these big monopolies in general. Some of them have deregulated and uh, they're more user friendly uh, and and are trying to solve the problem. But, but at the end of the day, these utilities are monopolies, right? So monopolies move slower than other types of companies. And so in general, rate tariffs aren't something that that every person at a utility fully understands. No disrespect to the utilities meant, um, but there's usually like a rates department and that rates department has created the rate design. And so you have to get to a specific department and few folks that understand all of the nuances of this college degree that doesn't exist. Okay, so so that's, that, that's one piece. Why don't you hear this from the EV charging industry? If you're a contractor, it's not something that, that, that you learned when you were younger. And if you try and learn this thing and bring it up, it's going to slow down your installations. So how much are you really going to talk about it? Not necessarily all the time. That's what I always say to folks is, what is driving the company that you're working with's core business? Because everyone's an EV charging expert in 2024. And so what's driving the core business and, and how much do they, you know, do they really understand it? Um, that, I, yeah, it, it's just, that, that's the big thing. And what are you doing today, right? Like, are you working directly with dealers on helping them kind of solve through these issues? Or like, I'm just curious to know what you're really doing today. Like, who's your customer? How that works? Let's just talk about, the, the dealership circumstance we kind of we kind of view um, in the automotive space for for car dealers I want to think about it at three levels or, or, or two different types of customers you get your dealer group right you get your dealer group they have 20 different brands in six different states with 15 different utilities so they were just told um, by each auto manufacturer exactly what type of hardware and software they should get and where they should put the charging stations. So what does that what does that create for a large dealer group? Um, creates a circumstance where you got 15 types of hardware. How do you handle all the support issue, is, issues for those? As employees end up leaving leaving the dealership or the dealer group, how do you train somebody to use that, that new charging station? Um, from a software perspective, then you have multiple different logins. It comes, becomes a little bit chaotic from, uh, but I, by logins, I mean logins for, for a software because all of these are managed charging solutions that have software front ends. Um, and then in most cases, they're, they're, they're being told where to put the chargers. And in many cases, the chargers sometimes are the proper use case, but sometimes I'll see a 24 kilowatt fast charger in a public area. And you know, how is that going to feel against a Tesla supercharger? Um, when someone's going to a Tesla store comparing a 258 kilowatt station to a 24 kilowatt station. So what we try and do is take three steps. We try and create ownership strategy around the charging solutions, the investments that are being made, how they're being connected to the utility grid. We try and simplify the management of that um, for, for ownership. And then once we understand the strategy ownership's trying to take, because everybody you know can do it a little bit differently, um, then we enable management. We help them understand the strategy ownership's trying to build around electrification and installing charging stations, how it's going to drive sales, how it's going to make operations more efficient. Um, and then we train sales and service staff on the investments that ownership made that management is now being enabled uh, to, to, to utilize to drive the core business. This episode is brought to you by Cars Commerce, the platform to simplify everything about buying and selling cars, including the quote unquote follow up. Let me explain. Dealers, fast and effective follow-up is crucial for converting leads into customers. But here's the problem. 40% of shoppers report that they are not getting timely or helpful responses from dealerships. This is a huge problem because your own team could be leaving four out of every 10 sales opportunities on the table. Cars Commerce makes it simple to measure and improve your follow-up performance. A Cars.com experience report tracks the percentage of leads your team is responding to and how customers rate those responses. While Dealer Inspire's retailing technology enables your team to quickly text follow-ups, 
with personalized financing options to make the most out of every opportunity. To learn more about how you can measure and improve your team's follow-up performance, go to carscommerce.inc slash experience or click the link in the show notes below. You know, I'm curious, like given you work so closely with so many dealers in the industry, what's the sentiment right now on the ground floor with respect to EV charging, disinvestment? Look, I we all know what sentiment has been for the past couple of years, but it, it has oscillated. So I'm curious to know, like uh, right now as it stands, what are you you know hearing, feeling on the ground floor from owners and GMs? Yeah, uh, I think the majority of dealerships that we're talking to they don't necessarily want to work with us. They're they're being put in a position to make an investment that they have to make, and they want some expertise in how to make the investment before they spend all the money. Uh, so I would say in general, the sentiment, man, is, is frustration. That's what it is. I think there was a phase three years ago where they're, you know, they're thinking, well, they're telling us EVs coming, but it hasn't really come yet. And so we're gonna make the investment because they're telling us to. And we've run into, you know, past that early adopter phase, I think we've run into like that second phase where all of the difficult questions are coming up and challenges. And it's, you know, it's difficult to get inventory. It's difficult to sell the inventory that that they're getting. I think there's a little bit of frustration around EV right now. I think that's real. I think it's very real. And especially hearing it from you, you're on the front lines. You know, I feel like every day someone on some social media platform plays engineer and says, you know, the grid can support this. The grid can't support this. Like, I didn't even, I have no idea like what the hell a grid can and cannot support. I can't even read my own electric bill. Like they get, they tell me like how much electric I use. Like they could, they could be ripping me off. They probably are ripping me off. I have no idea. All right. So let's not pretend like I'm an engineer. Um, but I want to ask you, right? Like, are these like people like, oh, the U S grid can't handle a growth in EVs or it can, like, is there truth to that? To what extent is there truth to that? What's your take? Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think what you're asking very much has turned into like this political question. Unfortunately, you hear both sides of it on, on, on the news channels. And and this is kind of how I lay it out. Can the grid handle it? Yes. Can the grid handle all DC fast charging stations? Wait one second. Handle what? When you, when you say handle it, what are you specifically referring to? (laughs) Yeah. Can can the utility grid handle the electrification of uh, the automotive industry in the United States? Yes. How much percent? How much percent are we talking? I believe it can handle a hundred percent over time. But here's the thing: I think like there's an assumption. There's a there's a really poor assumption made at the beginning of that question. Anytime it's 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 asked, um, and that and it's and it's around uh, uh, can the grid handle? the amount of gas stations that the United States has for electric. But th- that's not how electric cars work. So that world will never exist. Um, so I think that's the interesting thing about the grid here. So is our utility grid perfect? Absolutely not. It needs to be improved. It has all these challenges. I think electric cars, long-term, are going to be a solution to making the grid more resilient. It's, that's a big part of like what we talk about with the, you know a lot of customers. Um, and, and so how do we do that? Um, most utilities build, and, and uh, you know, if, if I'm from Boston, right? So Cape Cod in Boston is not built for the middle of the winter. It's built for the 4th of July at five o'clock. It doesn't need the amount of infrastructure that it has. And so if you can start to charge cars at certain times of the day, and the utility is gonna tell you what times of the day to charge it at, they're creating rules that incentivize uh, discounted uh, fueling at certain times of the day across the United States. And so if you can charge at certain times of the day where uh, the grid is not as strained, and what we'll be able to do is we'll be able to maximize the um, the infrastructure that has been placed out there. The, the second piece I would add is this is going to evolve but uh, o- over time, but um, battery storage is getting cheaper. There are ways to monetize capacity at dealerships today or to monetize battery storage in a way where, you know, hypothetically down the line, 15 school teachers are plugging their cars in at the school and and the school's charging off the batteries as opposed to off of the grid. That's not, you know, it's not in our immediate future the next couple of years, but that technology is coming. And once that technology comes, it's going to lower the cost of the grid. It's going to make it more stable. But that is, you know, too complex of a message sometimes to give to the American public uh, on a debate stage. (laughs) 
Oh, I can imagine. So you're saying that you could see a future where the utility companies are sort of like load balancing the, you know, the usage of the grid or whatnot. And maybe they are, you know, charging these storage batteries overnight. And then during the day, when you need to go charge your car, you don't have to tap into the grid, quote unquote. You can tap into these storage batteries and you're not straining the grid and everybody's happy. To take it a step further, if 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 you were a car dealership and you had 25 electric cars in your lot that were service cars, hypothetically, you could um, use those to power your, your car dealership uh, at, during the day so they don't have to pay the electricity. And then the utility might offer free charging at night on all those cars um, so that that capacity is being used. So that Ooh. that is a, a future that <laughs> now, now <laughs> arbitrage. Any, I like that. Does any car dealership care about that today? No, but that is technology that's coming. That is super interesting. I see. I totally get what you're saying. And look, let's be honest. Like they'll probably have some limits around these things, whether it be, you know, or I don't know how they'll limit it, but I I, I get your point. So tell me a little bit about like. Where are dealers making mistakes right now when it comes to electrification of their dealerships? And you mentioned earlier, right? We know that auto auto manufacturers are forcing dealers most of the times to install these chargers. One, you can make an argument that it's for a great reason. It's for a not great reason. We are selling more EVs. EV market share is growing. And I've been, I've also been very vocal that I think that as an industry, I think that dealers that are leaning into it from a commercial perspective will do well. I do think that the overall opportunity to make money here, um, from whether it's selling the car to you know ancillary services, I do think it's going to grow. So, but but with that said, where are dealers making the biggest mistakes today with respect to electrification? In your opinion, I work with with both sides. I work with the auto manufacturers. I work with the dealer groups. I work with the dealerships. I think one of the one of the main challenges that I see is a lot of times the way dealer equipment programs are built, it will be like, hey, you know, you have to install these stations in nine months or else. It puts dealerships in a really uh, challenging situation because many utility timelines to get a new service take longer than nine months or take longer than a year. It depends on the part of the country. And so in many cases, timelines kind of force them to install stations a certain way where the utility forces them to go on one of these expensive uh, operational tariffs where it might cost them 10 grand, 50 grand, 100 grand. If you're in Massachusetts right now uh, and you've been you know, told to install a lot of power, 300 grand a year, a year. And so that's one piece is making sure that the installation is done with utility economics in mind. That is missing in uh, the automotive space in 2024, period. Mm-hmm. And, and what's driving that? Is it is it just like the auto manufacturers with their arbitrary timelines? The, in most cases, yes. It generally, um, the and, and it's not for every auto manufacturer. I'm I'm speaking. I'm trying to speak generally. Um, there are some auto manufacturers that I think do a really good job with their programs, or other ones that put dealers in in a more challenging spot. Um, but yeah, there there's circumstances where where auto manufacturers will have deadlines, and those deadlines. Uh, that's the thing is you know. No, it's good for the contractor, you know, because the installation's occurring. Uh, it can be good for the charging company, but is it good for the dealership? Uh, in many cases, uh, you know, the answer might be no. Uh, so, so yeah, I think that's a big piece. The second one is is in investment obsolescence, is what I like to call it. Um, the EV charging industry right now is a moving target. It's chaos right now. There are. Uh, you know, the world uh, went public in 2019, every every charging company. Um, and, you know, with all these, you know, really strong projections, and don't get me wrong, I, I like a lot of these companies, um, but but this is what happened in the industry is a lot of the companies went public. And obviously in 2019, uh, there's an opportunity in, at that moment in time for companies from Europe, for companies from Asia to gain on the North American market because they know that so there are these policy requirements where people are being forced to put in EVs. And so a lot of new market entrants that shouldn't necessarily be in. There were even a lot of companies that tried to do EV charging. It didn't work. And they tried to get back into it five or six years later once the market started heating up again. Um, and, and I think for car dealers, everybody, you know, kind of knows, you know, they have, they have more money. They're being forced to make the investment. And, um, and, you know, if you're a car dealer, how many times have you gotten cold call over, over the past three years? And, and so it kind of created this like chaotic circumstance where, and, and, you know, what the other big one was, uh, Yoshi was when Ford made 
the announcement that they were switching from the standard J1772 CCS to Tesla's Next connector, and then the, in, the entire industry in North America essentially followed. How many charging stations in the United States right now have been installed without replaceable cables? So once the industry starts in volume putting the Nax plug on their vehicles, what percentage of the industry is going to have to um, replace their charging stations? And I think what that also forced in the industry as well is companies that had non-replaceable cables kind of started putting their chargers on clearance. And where do you think those charging station uh, you know, advertisements went to? To the people that had the money to buy them in that moment that were forced to do it. Um, so I think car dealerships across the United States are going to have to um, replace a very large percentage of their charging stations in the U.S. I, I you know, I, I don't, I don't want to say the percentage because it's so high. To your point, like it seems like we're getting into a lot of, you know, quote unquote technical debt. Um, except in real life, we're not talking about software. A, a bit, a bit of a tangent here, but as you were speaking, I was thinking about just the complexity of a lot of this. Do you see dealerships offering ch- um, charging installation? as a value added product like you know in the f and i office like dealers are selling charging installation do you see that happening nowadays yeah oh i've seen it and i've also seen ones that are are against it um the ones that are forward obviously are trying to provide the entire service and and i think providing services like that are really valuable in the ev world there's a networked component to um to ev that i think uh, dealerships can take advantage of that's also another one but some of them are concerned with the liability of that charging station, something happening to that station in somebody's um, house and, 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 and dealing with insurance issues. This episode is brought to you by my very own car dealership guy, Industry Job Board. CDG Jobs is revolutionizing how talent connects with top automotive companies. Here's a shocker. We're not using any fancy technology or AI. We literally built a simple HTML job board. That's it. But it works really, really well. And the best part, it's completely free for CDG listeners to post and fill positions at their firm. So I'm sure you're wondering what sets us apart. Well, when companies hire through CDG Jobs, they're choosing from a pool of the most informed candidates in the industry. Don't wait. Whether you're hiring or seeking a new opportunity, visit cdgjobs.com today or click the link in the show notes below. That's cdgjobs.com. All right. So flipping back to the chargers, right? Give us a little like spark notes over the actual hardware in stores, like dealers that are installing these. You mentioned lots of charges will need to be replaced. Are you referring to like on-site dealership chargers or are you referring to like the more public superchargers, right? Are these investments, listen, Ford recently announced that they're, you know, changing up their entire um, an electrification program with dealers. Dealers are were pissed. They were, you know, I, I received a ton of messages from dealers. They're like, hey, I just spent a million bucks and now they're kind of, you know, rescinding this program. Like, what the hell? You know, do you anticipate a lot more of that? How, like, just give us a little overview. Go ahead. I think what you're going to see is more deliberate programs in the future. You know, I think in the past you saw programs where every dealership had the exact same requirement across North America or or the United States. And and um, it didn't matter whether you were in like Manhattan or you were in uh, North Dakota, uh, all of the all of the requirements were the same. I think where you're gonna see is a more thoughtful approach to how many chargers are needed where. I think you're gonna see more um, more interest in going after funding across the United States. And I think in general, funding isn't really thought of very well uh, in the industry right now. In the dealership space, you know, dealerships are losing out in funding all the time uh, because program or projects are going too fast. So I think you'll see you'll see a heavy focus um, on that in future programs. I think instead of requiring a specific vendor in many cases, there's gonna be more optionality. Um, you know, Porsche, for example, Porsche required that dealerships got Porsche branded charging stations. It's like it, it, Porsche is like the like they're like the Luxottica of you know Luxottica the the, the eyeglass. Yeah, oh company, yeah, yeah, right. Totally. They're like you. See, they're like they're like producing <laughs> for like ten dollars like Burberry glasses, Gucci glasses. And so when you tell me that, I'm like, come on, Porsche. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy. So yeah, so Porsche. Um, re- required branded Porsche chargers. But the reality was Porsche doesn't make those chargers. What Porsche did is the same thing that my company does. <laughs> they went out, they found a hardware manufacturer, they found some type of a software platform yeah, and they course. have some, t- 
And if that, if it, look, if it works out for, if it works out great, but, but they have to deal with, you know, whatever they, they, they on-ramped or white labeled. So I have my, my computer screen here to my left and I have my notes and I get these like notifications on the screen. So I, I received an, a message right now as you're speaking, actually it's technically it's 20 minutes ago, um, from a guy named Tom Gilbert. He's a GM of, um, Lexus of Kendall. Great, great, great guy. He's been a longtime follower. And he just wrote to me, he's like, maybe you could get someone from a charging company to discuss how EV charging infrastructure is coming along. Just a thought. <laughs> I swear to God, I can, I will show you my screen. I will share my screen right now. I, I, I just wrote to the guy as you were speaking. I'm like, I'm like, dude, I'm blown away. Like, what are the odds that as I'm recording this episode, I get this message. So very timely. Yeah. All right. I'll leave it at that. Let's keep going. But that was crazy. Um, <laughs> no, that's all right. Awesome so, yeah, it's crazy. Absolutely nuts. Uh, but it just shows you that people are actually genuinely like curious about this stuff. I want to ask you about, I want to get to the brass tacks of like, what are you actually seeing as like the costs of like the installs and stuff like that? One thing before we do that, what are you seeing again, install process? Like how much should this cost? How much is it costing? Like give us a little kind of benchmarking. Yeah, so so I can answer that question. But what I'd say, Yoshi, is, the problem in the industry is that's the focus. The real cost is this other cost. That is the more expensive thing that doesn't have a line item that people are getting crushed by. Related to install costs, um, what, what I would say for dealers, like, uh, you know, the average level three charger usually. Here, you know what? Wait, Chris, let me explain this in dealer terms, right? Let me explain this in dealer terms. You know how the vehicle, when we sell a used car, right? Let's just, on average, you're making like, I don't know, 10% margin, maybe 6%, maybe 12%, whatever, right? But when you sell that warranty or that, you know, that gap insurance, that vehicle service contract, you're making 50, 60, 70% margin, depends on the dealership, right? Same exact thing, right? The customer comes in, they're they're mainly focused on the price of the car, the low margin product, although it is a higher, actually absolute number, but it's, it's a, a lower margin analogy. product. They're not as focused on the... Yeah, they're not as focused on the vehicle service contract because, you know, it's it's after the after you've already agreed on the price, it's like the afterthought, right? In a way. So this is kind of the same thing with what based on what you've told me, that's how I would summarize this conversation. It's that us as dealers, we are being the consumer right now, right? We are focusing on the price of the car, but we're not focusing on the vehicle service contract, which is at 60% margin, while the car is only at like 10% margin. That's my yeah, analogy. You nailed it. That's your, that's it. That's, feel, uh, feel, free, feel free to use that one. I'm going to steal that. that I'm going to steal that from you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to use it. I, I am going to use it. Go yeah. Use it. That, it, it, right. It's tough. So talk to it, me about costs. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, generally the focus is on, is on, uh, the cost of the, the, the charging solution. So it's a combination of hardware, software, and then type of a, some type of a maintenance solution. In general, the hardware is is um, commoditized. Uh, there are certain charging solutions that that are better than other charging solutions. Um, I would say that the commoditization is more so on the on the level two side, uh, back of house. Um, but you're you're paying for hardware, software services. You know, let's just say the cost of a DC charger is forty thousand dollars. Cost of software for five years, about $5,000, something like that. And then there's usually a maintenance plan. Maintenance is usually about 25% of the cost of hardware, you know, give or take, and, you know, just given like an industry average. The thing about the maintenance plans is a lot of the maintenance plans are, um, are, are not great. They, you know, they cover the hardware, they have two people in support and, um, you know, good luck trying to get, you know, get your hardware covered or get your hardware fixed. The other thing too is uh, a, a lot of charging solutions don't have replaceable parts. And so the end uh, charging vendor has to decide, do I sell another charger or do I fix one of the broken ones that we already sold? Um, so so those are the 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 costs, hardware, software, services. Um, and let's just say like, you know, a, a, a fast charger is 40 grand. It can vary. There's $250,000 fast chargers out there, but let's just say it costs 40 grand Software is five, maintenance is 10, 10,000. Um, and then the installation. So I'm just going to give you some data. Across the United States right now, uh, utilities are coming out with what's called utility make-ready programs where they are paying for the cost of the installation of charging stations. 
it's funny because everybody wants to talk about the Nevi funding. The utility maker already funding is much more can applicable you explain, to ne- can, I was going to ask you, can you explain this Nevi funding for uh, the audience, just what this means? It's National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Funding. It's funding um, that, that Biden came out with a few years ago, where he gave the different states money to... Um, to subsidize EV charging uh, station installations or, or, or solutions. And so every DOT was provided funding across the United States. What's challenging about that funding though, everyone really focuses on it. We always hear, hey, can you get us NEVI funding? Can you get us NEVI funding? There's red tape. DOT has to come up with the funding and build the plan. And then they pick specific pins on the map in most cases for fast charging where you can be qualified. If you're not with, within one of those pins, you're not qualified then you have to put in the minimum requirement, which is 450 kilowatt chargers. And and then even if you do all that, you have to go compete against uh, everybody else for the money. What's happening right now in the US is Tesla is winning the majority of the funding uh, in the United States because they've just locked, uh, they built their own product uh, their installation services are so locked in. They've built, you know, these these um, these slabs that lower their installation costs, and uh, and and they're winning the majority of the funding in the United States right now. Um, so that's Nevi funding. What is what dealers should really care about is, and there's other funding mechanisms, but the core one that they should care about is utility make already programs, programs where the utility has rate based. They've taken money from the general population of rate payers. And uh, they've put it aside to pay for the installation of charging stations. These exist um, in certain t- territories across the United States. Uh, Massachusetts has $500 million. New York has a billion dollars. California had a billion dollars. It's gone now, but I'm sure they'll, they'll find some more money. Um, but utility make ready programs are, are uh, where dealerships can usually very easily go after funding if it exists in their territories. Mm-hmm. You know, I had a dealer from Pennsylvania send me a note like a, a month or two ago, and they were very frustrated. They were like, hey, so I'm being forced to install these chargers, and guess what? I just got a note in the mail or from their their dealer association that now they have to start paying usage tax on on the charging. And they were like, and, and so they specifically told me, they're like, when was the last time I was forced to install a gas station and then get taxed on on the usage? <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I posted this thing, got like hundreds of comments and it went, you know, it went pretty viral. Uh, but that was uh, someone that, you know, really exhibited that frustration. I, I'm not sure who you're speaking with. We might have talked, we might have spoken with the same guy because um, we had a dealer in Pennsylvania reach out to us to say, like, how do we handle this? And, and, and you know, the truth is like, it's this, this is very early. Do I think other, do I think other states are going to do this? Yeah, probably. All right, so Chris, this has been an awesome conversation. Talk to me about you know the next couple of years here. We've gone through all this change. Where's our industry headed, right? And I'm and I want to know from a from a charging perspective, you know, from an infrastructure perspective, right? Where do you see this industry headed in an, over the next couple of years with respect to the EV the EV charging network and infrastructure? First, I just want to talk from like a, a politics perspective, right? We have a huge election coming up. Like this is a really strong political topic. I was in the industry in 2016 when when Trump was elected the first time, um, and there was a lot of there was a lot of concern about uh, on the you know the pro EV side of what's going to happen. From my perspective, I think the political piece, like everyone's sort of got to let go and separate. Let's think about this about a new emerging technology only. I don't care you know what you know what what your political circumstances. This is a new emerging technology. It requires really good infrastructure. Uh, it requires education, and um, and once you once you uh, once there are more fast chargers out there where people feel like they can get to where they need to get to. And Massachusetts is easy where I live, but uh, I went to Ohio once. Not so easy. It was it was a lot more difficult to to get to where you needed to get to. Um, uh, I think electrification is inevitable. It's a better technology. It's going to be better for the grid long term. Uh, they're 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 fun cars to drive. In ma- in many cases, they can be safer. Um, and so EV is happening, and I think everybody should get ready for it. That said, uh, w- one of the gentlemen who works at EV Ready always kind of laughs when I say this to people. Uh, but stop buying chargers for a second. 
and sort of question what you're being told to do. Find somebody that can um, help you make investments that are going to put you in a strong position. Because now we're not just talking about selling a car. Um, we're talking about uh, fueling, the, fueling the vehicle. And, and it is um, tied to tied to a cloud, which creates challenges, but also but also creates opportunities. And now it's tied to the utility, which creates challenges and opportunities. If people can educate themselves on um, what their electrification strategy needs to be, and it, that's not just charging, that's also battery storage, um, but the the whole thing take take the whole the the whole uh, the whole puzzle, put it together, um, and then tell a story to an end user that they can relate to, that they can see their lives and how they would fit into owning some type of an electric vehicle. And look, the reality is sometimes they won't. If you have a snow truck and and you need to plow snow in the Northeast, you're probably not getting an electric car right now for your day to day. And I respect that and I understand that. And there's gonna be other use cases, but in general, um, I think over the next several years, we're just gonna get to a position where the costs of these EVs are gonna come down over time. Uh, people are gonna be driving them more, which means they're gonna get more educated. It's like 2008 when, when the smartphone came out. And, um, and in general, people that are kind of like on the edge are slowly going to, going to be more comfortable with purchasing an EV. I want to make, I'll give you one more statistic. When Apple made iMessage, I don't think that they ever expected that iMessage was going to maintain uh, con consumers within entire generations. And why? Well, go ask the generations. Uh, most of them will say, because the text messages are blue. 87% of Gen Z had an iPhone uh, three years ago. Today, 90% of Gen Z has an iPhone. Why do they have such strong market share? Network despite effects. Despite the fact, exactly, exactly. So that that's kind of my, you know, my opinion to the auto manufacturers or, or my recommendation to the auto manufacturers into the dealership groups is get past just selling the vehicle. This generation cares less about style and and focus more on the experience, more specifically the software experience in the center dash. Um, obviously, that's something that Tesla does, and they do a very good job of it. But I think whoever capitalizes on the software experience over the next five years is going to gain significantly more market ship. And those that are still trying to sell the stitching and the steering wheel are going to have some trouble. Well said. And I totally agree with you. Like I, I, always, I have this infamous tweet um, that I posted a couple of times, which is, you know, Nowadays, consumers come and they just want four wheels and Apple CarPlay. So again, it's just really meant to be a proxy for people care about the experience a lot more than the car in many cases, not always, but that it's become increasingly important. Um, and, and real quick, you mentioned the manufacturers. I'm curious, like which manufacturers would you say are leading versus lagging on the installation and electrification journey? And 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 when you ask that, do you mean the actual uh, installation of chargers? Do you mean the 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 experience of the electric vehicle, just in general? I think I think <laughs> yeah, general general speaking, like is there any manufacturers that are like excelling when it comes to you know equipping their dealers with chargers and the process and the you know anything any any manufacturers that stand out as a great experience versus a not so great? I mean, we all know. Again, I mentioned I mentioned Ford and kind of their kind of back and forth. Um, and you know, the challenges they've had, but I'm, I'm curious if anyone else comes to mind on a positive or negative. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, one auto manufacturer, um, that I think has been very thoughtful, um, whom I, I have a relationship with them and, and I think all of their dealers would agree, Toyota, Toyota and Lexus, they take a very unique and thoughtful approach to everything that they do. I think that's the the Kaizen in them that they always that they always talk about. And so they didn't necessarily tell their dealers to do too much or too little. I think they really took feedback from their dealer body and and, and look for experts in the industry to tell them what they should be focusing on. I think that's why they have the reputation that they have. So I'm pro I'm sure that's like no no sh no shock. Um I think Mercedes is doing a, a great job with ChargePoint right, right now building uh, the center dash experience um, with with ChargePoint, and I'm not sure what other ones are you know under NDA or not un, un, under NDA, but I think in general they're you know the ones that are trying to build this, the central dash experience are on the right track. Um, I've seen Fords, I haven't used it too much, but 
I think that they're thinking about it the right way, that they need something, you know, like that in terms of the central dash experience. Everybody knows the frustrations of, of you know, some of these larger programs where fast chargers were, were required and, you know, we are coming out of COVID and what's the allocation look like and um, in what parts of the country is it more difficult to to sell those vehicles. So I think like some of those bigger programs that I, you know, applaud the OEMs for it, for trying to, you know, push it out fast and trying to build it. But I think there's been more frustration there and there's still more value to be had. I would say, you know, I think what's really important here in the next in the next few years is if you're a dealer group, if you are a dealer group, what is your plan? You're being told to do 10, 15, 20 different things. What is your plan? Otherwise, you know, you end up investing $20 million in in a uh, potentially obsolete set of circumstances, there is an opportunity here. Yes, investment is being forced upon you, uh, but at the same time, there's an opportunity to add a new element to your business, new revenue streams to your business. Um, and having a plan before making all the investments is going to allow put you in a good position. I think I think there's even an opportunity for dealer groups to make, you know how Tesla has their supercharging network, OEMs are trying to do it. I think dealer groups can do localized networks too, utilizing software to sell more cars. I think there's an opportunity there. Um, you just you just got to build it and and you got to make sure that you uh, build a plan before you spend the money. Mm-hmm. Well said, Chris. Uh, this has been awesome. You are a wealth of knowledge, so I've really enjoyed this. If anyone listening wants to get in touch with you or wants to ask you more questions, is there somewhere they can get in touch with you? Yeah, definitely. So um, we have uh, a, a consulting and energy service that we provide end users called EV Ready Simplify, and it really is meant to either help you with your future plan, course correct on an existing plan that already happened, um, but we want to help you save money. That's that's the goal. It's not about buying more chargers. It's about saving you more money. Um, so we have a, uh, if you go to e- evreadyenergy.com, go to our website, uh, we have a questionnaire that questionnaire will ask you specific questions about the decisions that have been made so far, where you're trying to go, and it'll allow us to understand where you are in your electrification journey. Um, from there, what we'll do is we'll schedule a consultation to follow up with you, um, to help you take whatever next steps that um, is going to help you save more money in the future. Yeah, we're, gonna, we're we'll add it to the show notes as well below. So if anyone is interested, they can just go to the show notes below. Awesome. Awesome. And and I just want to thank Rexel Energy Solutions. They're a partner of ours that we work with. Um, Rexel Energy Solutions is a distributor across the U.S. that helps dealerships um, procure and install charging stations with EV Ready Energy um, and provide other specific services that's going to um, help lower their total cost of ownership. So I just wanted to um, say thank you to them. Chris Nyan, thanks for coming on. I really enjoyed it. Okay. Thanks, man. Appreciate the time. All right. Hope you enjoyed that episode. Please give the podcast a rating, consider subscribing to the show, and check the show notes for links to what we talked about. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you guys next time.